this joint service with Old Audubon and Mount Vernon as we are celebrating or really living the stations of the cross. We invite you to truly be present tonight, to listen to the reflections, see yourself, and more importantly, see Christ as he walks through this road to crucifixion. We have celebrated our uh, Maundy Thursday. We've had Jesus wash the feet of the disciples and had his last supper. And now he is on his way to the reason that he came for all of us. So let us now have our hearts and minds set on all of our stations of the cross. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for all of us who are not only participating, but being a part in their hearts with these, these readers, these servants of yours. Give them strength and Holy Spirit be present with us as they speak. And let their hearts be strangely warm and give them the power to be able to touch all of us as we hear and see Jesus in his last days. This service of Tenebrae uses the eight biblical stations of the cross as a framework for the scripture readings, meditations, and prayers. We will follow Jesus via the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrow, as he journeys from Pilate's hall to his death on the cross. We enter this journey with the penitence prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any way, wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also and with, you. with you. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This, this is, is the Lord's gate. gate. The, the righteous shall enter through it. I will give thanks because you have answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone, the stone that the, build, the builders, builders reject from the chief cornerstone. cornerstone. This has come from the Lord. It is marvelous, it is marvelous in, our eyes. in our eyes. This is the day on which the Lord has acted. Let, Let us shout with joy and rejoice in it. In it. Please save us, O oh Lord, please. O oh oh Lord, Lord, please bring, please bring success. success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless, we bless you from, from the, the house, house of the Lord. Lord. The Lord is God. He, he has, has given us life. life. With, with cords, with festival sacrifice to the horns of the altar. altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. 
You are, you my, are my God. I will, I will extol, extol you. you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love, love endures, endures forever. forever. O oh Lord, we are gathered together here this day as your people, as those who have been called out of darkness into your marvelous light. We are here only because you have loved us and been faithful across the generations that we might be your people. And yet we quickly confess that we are not worthy of that love. As we contemplate the cross and what it means, we are filled with joy and wonder at the sacrifice that Jesus has made to show us light in the darkness and offer us light in the midst of death. We confess that we have nothing to offer in return for that sacrifice, nothing that will match such love. We know that only love can respond to such a gift. Yet we know that we are not always loving or lovable, but you remain steadfastly faithful to us. You love us even when we are not no lovable and remain steadfast in your grace that calls us to follow the example of Jesus who is the Christ. We are committed to that journey, to be followers of the one who has given so much that we might be sons and daughters of God. But sometimes the journey that we take in following Jesus, who is the Christ, is not all light and joy. Sometimes the way is rough and dimly lit. Sometimes the darkness of life threatens to engulf the light. So... We cry out to you, O Lord, forgive us for sometimes faltering steps. Show us more clearly the way. Shine anew the light of your presence into our lives so strongly that a new love for you will be kindled. Light within us a love beyond emotion and sentimentality, a love that is willing to lay aside all privilege and self-centeredness. Grow within us a love that is willing to surrender all our fears and uncertainties to you, that desires nothing more than to love God for with all our being and to love those around us with the same faithfulness with which you love us. Now, as we begin this journey of the cross, we open our hearts and minds to you, O God. We lay aside for these moments the trivialities of our life and bring ourselves into your presence. Speak to us what we need to hear and help us to hear not just the words that are spoken, but your word spoken afresh in our hearts. Speak. For your service. Let us begin our journey. Mm. 
Now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you say so. But when we, he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not e even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to the crowd to be crucified. So can you picture the scene we just read? The crowd standing before Pilate, Jesus standing beside him, his body worn, his spirit exhausted. Are you able to feel the energy oozing around the plaza? The tension that is already building, perhaps you can hear the whispers that are flowing person to person, creating that hum that permeates the air. I, I certainly can. In fact, frequently I picture myself within that scene. As the scriptures are read, and mostly on, on this most holy of nights, even in this opening scene, I feel myself tense up with the crowd. I hear Pilate's loud, billowing questions to Jesus, piercing through that hum of the crowd, cutting through the tension. Yet, it's the Lord, it's our Lord's whispered reply of, you say so, that cuts me most deeply. Our Lord continues to cut me with his silence before the priests and the elders questioning. It cuts me for unlike Pilate's claim, as a person within the crowd, I am not innocent of this man's blood. He is being tortured for me. He's being flogged for me. He is being handed over for me. Sure, I wasn't actually in that crowd that particular day, but I was on the school bus, the crowded school bus when Derek was being made fun of. And like the crowd, I was at best silent. However, more likely, I wasn't silent. I may have even encouraged the crowd by laughing alongside those that tormented Derek. Was Derek not Jesus for me at that particular moment? Was no one to speak for him at that time? And sure, I wasn't actually there in that crowd on that particular day, but a little later, I, I was in the locker room when someone made a comment about Lisa's dress. Once again, I was silent at best, and more lo likely, I was not. More likely, I had my own stupid comment that I now deeply regret about just how much I appreciated how short her hemline was. Was Jesus not, was Lisa not Jesus for me at that moment? Was no one to speak for him at that time? Finally, I wasn't actually in the crowd on that particular day, but I was there last year when so many were suffering. Suffered, suffering as they struggled against a long history of racism and oppression. Suffering as they didn't know how to care for their children and families, being physically and emotionally ill with COVID. Yet, at best, I was making sympathetic comments to friends from the safety of my sofa in my living room. But more likely, I was silent. More likely, I was unwilling to do anything to change the narrative. Were these neighbors and friends not Jesus for me last summer? If I was unwilling to speak last summer, unwilling to act for him, is he not being tortured for me today? Is he not being flogged for me today? 
Is he not being handed over for me today? Jesus, I see in your silence the quiet strength that reveals a peace and a resolve. O oh Lord, help me deal with the unfairness of life without becoming critical of others. Help me to be sensitive to the pain and feelings of others. Give me the courage to do what is right without being swayed by the demands of others. O oh. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They sped on him and they took the reed and struck him on his head. After, mock after mocking them, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they lead him away to crucify him. Carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what was called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is, is called Golgotha. Well, hello. Hello, Audubon. How are you? Um, you know, I'm sure all of us has had a stripped down moment in their life. Doesn't matter if it's clothes, you forgot to tell somebody that they didn't have something on. You forgot to even suggest to someone that it'll be all right. Well, the third one is usually the best place to go, but it's so hard to get there. When somebody tells either one of us, uh, your zipper's unzipped, your shoe's not tied, you, you're missing a glove on your hand. It feels a little hum humiliating, but it's truly not. All we're doing is just showing how, how we are for Jesus. It's a good thing to tell everybody who they are, what they do, and how they do it. Lord, forgive me for forgetting that in my weakness, I am driven to trust on you and that in such trust, my weakness becomes your strength. Forgive my attitudes of self-pity that make me more repulsive than lo loving. I do not ask for crosses to bear 
But when they come, give me strength to bear them as one who follows your example. O oh Lord, oh Lord full be merciful, merciful to us. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry the, his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. And a couple of weeks ago, Aronce Reddix, the pastor from Otterbein, surprised me when she asked me to not only read a piece here, but also to prepare a reflection. And over the past couple of weeks, as I've tried to prepare that reflection, the operative word here being try, um, I, I've struggled. I've struggled a lot. And I have struggled with what I'm going to say here tonight. And frankly, right now, as I'm speaking, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I do know that for me, my experience with faith and the God and old Otterbein and even my, the neighborhood in which I live has always been a very complicated one for a lot of reasons. Um, being a physical science major in college certainly makes having just plain faith difficult with, um, it just it makes having just plain faith difficult. Um, and then, you know, I've been fortunate or perhaps unfortunate, depending on your point of view, to have traveled all around the world and been in a bunch of different places, exposed to a lot of different things. Um, but I do know that whenever things start to get real complicated for me, and what I'm about to do, maybe you all are going to think of it as cheating. Um, that's fine. Um, but whenever it gets really complicated for me, I always default to what I think are my favorite words in the Bible. And that's the first chapter of the gospel according to John. So for my reflection tonight, I'm going to kind of simplif simplify things for myself here. Um, bring myself back to center, and I hope bring some of you back to center with me. And I'm just going to, like I said, cheat, whatever you want to call it. And I'm going to read from the first chapter of the gospel according to John. Um, and bear with me here as I find my place. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And with that, I'm going to close my reflection. 
and wish you all a good evening and say amen. Amen. Oh Lord, forgive me for becoming so preoccupied with myself that I have become deaf and blind to the grief and suffering of those around me. Forgive me for my indifference. Constantly remind me that I cannot live, love you without loving others as well. Help me always remember that to be a follower of yours means that I share in the burdens of others. Lord, show me someone whose cross I may help carry. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord hear our prayer. Hear our prayers. Yes. A great number of people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills cover us. Then they will again say to the hills cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? I probably avoided throughout the time that I was in active ministry preaching on what's called apocalyptic. These phrases that remind us of the end times have never been any of my favorites. But looking at these words of Jesus to the women, these words that Luke records uniquely not naming specific women in his gospel as Matthew, Mark, and John have done, maybe as many as seven named in those three gospels, but Luke looks instead at the crowd he doesn't name the women. His gospel reports that there's a crowd following Jesus, some of them out of devotion, some probably in horror, and some just eager for a spectacle. And Luke adds this group of women to these whom Jesus addresses as daughters of Jerusalem, there's a message that is both a warning and a reassurance. He warns them that after his death, nothing will be easily resolved. As bad as things are, they can get worse. So bad that they might wish that they had never born children, that ultimate expression of hope in the future. 
Jesus uses words and images that are rooted in the Hebrew scriptures, his Bible, his own words of lament over Jerusalem that he has spoken on his way to this cross of Calvary, but also expressing special concern for women and children. And then speaking of apocalyptic or end times in images from the prophets Hosea and Ezekiel. Over a year ago, a young friend asked me a question in all seriousness. But before they asked, they needed reassurance that I would not think them crazy for asking, do you think this is the end? They were not crazy. It was an apocalyptic question, one we perhaps didn't ask often enough before this year that we have just endured. I could absolutely sympathize. I was having not what if, but when conversations with my husband. We agreed not to let anything go unexpressed just in case. We acknowledged that if one of us left the house for the emergency room, we might never see one another again. That seemed pretty end times to us a year ago. We have survived, but now we have endured, all of us, a year of unimaginable events and nearly inconceivable losses, not just of lives and livelihood, but of so many intangible things I won't even begin to name. We have had times over the past year when we surely have felt that the apocalypse was on our doorstep, the end of life as we have known it. And surely there were times on the way to the cross when the people who were following Jesus must have been asking, is this the end of everything? When Jesus calls to mind these images familiar to them from the prophets of Israel, ironically, he points his listeners to a future with a glimmer of hope. The prophets foretold suffering for the children of Israel and suffer they did, but the story of the people of Israel carried on. Those whom God had chosen were never truly alone in their suffering. God was still for them. Jesus' care for the most vulnerable expressed during his lifetime would also not end with his death. In fact, in his crucifixion would be his most complete identification with human suffering. Not suffering instead of us, but suffering with us, fully entering into our human pain. Because Jesus was true man and true God, in his crucifixion, he brought human suffering right into the heart of the Trinity, the Godhead. And in God, with Jesus, we would never be alone, no matter what suffering we endured. You may be curious to know how I answered my questioner. I told them, I don't think this is the end. I don't know what the end will be but I do know that we will be changed by this experience. Tonight, even as we pause on the way to the cross with Jesus, on this Good Friday, we already know the end of the story. In the end, God wins, life wins. So may the resurrection that is to come remind us that God is for us and God is with us. And may we all be changed once again because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh Lord, forgive my unwillingness to repent, to confess all that I am before you. Help me go beyond the repentant mouth in words of false piety to sweep away all the facades of who I try so hard to be before others and recall who I really am inside. Help me once again stand before God with a bare and open heart. Help me not just to repent in words, but to put that repentance into action in everything I am and do. Oh Lord, give me the gift of tears to weep for my own failures, <laughs> for my sins, for the pain I bring to others and to live the fruits of repentance. Oh Lord, be merciful to us. To us.
When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing, they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Whew. Thank you for all the other readers. You kind of prepared me and helped me um, say what I was, wasn't going to, wasn't sure what I was going to say. But um Within the last four stations, it made me think about being naked or not having any clothes. And my personal reflection is kind of a funny story. A couple of years ago, I was an uncle. That is the combination of being an uncle and a nanny. Mm -hmm. And it was for family. And it was for my great niece and my great nephew. Um, as men, you know, we do not like to be seen with, with bare chest unless we have something to show. And then we choose when we want to show what we want to show. And then at other times we hide it. One night um, I was watching, I had watched over my great niece and great nephew. We had gone to bed and a great, we were, I lived in Texas at the time. And when this a storm came through, the lightning was horrendous. The thunder shook the house. Um, I was in bed, bare chested, as I normally do when I'm sleeping. Um, and lo and behold, I heard a voice that said, Uncle Aaron, Uncle Aaron. And it was my niece and my great niece and great nephew. And the storm had wakened them and they were of course, terrified. So um, I went, took them to their room and I laid in the middle of the bed. I had my nephew on my left and my great niece on my right. And I just kind of held them. And within minutes, I would say probably two minutes, they went to sleep. But in my mind, I was like, Oh my gosh, Aaron, you're in bed with two children and you're half naked. It was just the weirdest experience. But the thing was, they went to sleep. I was half naked all by myself, but it was for them. And, I, and, and this reflection makes me think that Christ gave his life, went through all of this for his children. The us as his family at large. And I just think that such a wonderful, awesome thing. And it was probably a bit scary as well. But for Christ, there go I. Amen. That's my reflection. Amen. 
O oh Lord, forgive me for wanting to take the path of glory and reward. Forgive me for my selfishness that wants to serve you in easy ways and seeks the reward of others' praise. Lord, teach me the humility of spirit that replaces self-centeredness with a sacrificial spirit. Make me vulnerable so that I may follow your example. Help me see those around me who are in need. Give me the courage to lay aside the things that I use to hide from their need and find ways to minister to others as you have shown us. O oh Lord, oh Lord, 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 our prayers. Our prayers. Our prayers. Our prayers. Station six, Jesus is nailed to the cross and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh and he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by him derided him, shaking their heads and saying, aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests along with the scribes were also mocking him among themselves and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe those who were crucified with him, crucified with him also taunted him. This evening, I thought I would reflect uh, on this station, Jesus being nailed uh, to the cross by focusing on the forgiveness of God. In this text, Jesus has been nailed to the cross between two thieves. There he is mocked by those who passed, by the religious leaders, and even the thieves who were crucified alongside him. There he witnessed people casting lots for his clothing. All the while, as a result of being nailed to the cross, his blood was being shed. He was dying for you, for me. And even those who mocked him and cast lots for his clothing. Scripture tells us that there is no forgiveness without blood being shed. It is the shedding of Jesus's blood his death that affords us forgiveness of our sins. Forgiveness when we miss the mark. We miss the mark when we fail to do those things that God that please God, and when we deliberately do those things that displease God. Yet God, through his unconditional love, has offered his son Jesus, nailed to a cross, as the ultimate sacrifice for our forgiveness the forgiveness of humankind. Take a moment and imagine Jesus being nailed to the cross. Look and see him nailed to the cross. Look and see him among various people, among sinners, among individuals who 
missed the mark. The thieves missed the mark. Those who mocked him missed the mark. Those who cast lots for his clothing missed the mark. And if we, if I imagine myself at the foot of the cross, I too have missed the mark. Look even closer. Nailed to the cross is your forgiveness, my forgiveness, forgiveness for all who believe, for he, the blessed savior, our Messiah, Jesus, the Christ shed his blood for us. I end with the words of a song that simply say, he would not come down from the cross just to save himself. <clears throat> he decided to die just to save me. Thank you, Jesus, for not coming down from the cross. Thank you, almighty God, for the get forgiveness you've afforded us through the sacrifice of your son. Amen. Lord, remind me of the deathly cost of sin. Forgive me for those things I have done and that are displeasing to you. Forgive me for not allowing you to deal with the darkness that I har harbor in the hidden recesses of my heart. Forgive me for fooling myself into believing that I am more righteous than I am, that I am better than others, and that I have no need to re repent. Forgive me for those things I should have done, but found excuses not to do. Oh Lord, make me better than I am. Transfer me into what I can be by your grace. Oh, oh Lord, Lord, forgive, forgive us for those things we have done and those and things, those things we, have we have left undone. undone. In, in your grace, grace be merciful, be merciful be to, us. to us.
Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Hmm. John's gospel is, is the only one which records that Mary, mother of Jesus, is present at the crucifixion. She is with family and friends. Jesus hanging on the cross is going to eternal life above and is preparing for his mother's life on earth. A woman left behind who now needed to be cared for. While in excruciating agony of the worst possible death, with nothing left to cling to as a human, even then his mind lifted above his shattering pain. He was calm enough to think, pray, and plan for others. After all his monumental ambitions for us, the world, spiritually, he puts first his homely duties. Let us remember that he loved his mother. He was a baby at her breast. He apologized to her for causing her to worry when he stayed back at the temple. He labored at the family carpentry business until he was about 30 and saved his mother's social anguish to gallantly provide wine for the wedding at Cana. He did not fail his flesh and blood. Through unimaginable suffering, he made provision for her future. Woman, this is your son. And to the beloved disciple, here is your mother. Jesus has entrusted her care for life here on earth. May we face death with like unselfishness and thoughtfulness for others. It is only after he arranged the matter for his mother does he allow himself to submit to his own needs. It is finished. Oh Lord, make me whole so that I may love with the compassion with which you love. Give me the courage to stand beside those who are hurting and share their pain. You know everything about me, my weakness, my faults, and my sin. Redeem me and make me new. Through your strength and by your grace, make me a conduit of your love, not just to the lovable, but to any who need to be cared for and loved. O oh Lord, Lord, hear our prayers. Our prayers. Our prayers. Thank you. 
When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. Earlier, Art suggested that he might have been cheating by reading from the scriptures. And I have to admit that I'm cheating too tonight. If you know me very well, you know that I am a was a literature major and I have collected poetry over the years about the scriptures, maybe from almost every story in the Bible. And when I began to think about the meditation for tonight on this scripture, I turned to a poet that I've recently discovered by the name of Carol Penner who is a Mennonite poet from Canada. And she reflects on Peter and his reaction to the crucifixion that's coming and then reacts to what has happened. My first thought was, it's not going to be me. Jesus, in a voice barely audible, told us that we would all become deserters. When I protested, he looked at me and singled me out and said that I would deny him as well. After everything that we had gone through together, after all I had left behind these three years of ministry, how could he doubt me? Was I not the only one who stepped out of the boat? Waves raging, my one thought to be at his side? With all my heart, I had told him what I knew to be true, that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. Me desert him? Never. Then and there I vowed, that I would not leave this man. I am going to stick with Jesus, whatever the cost, prison, death, nothing will stop me. And I am a man of my word. We heard the soldiers coming, but Jesus did not move. He only waited. And then the betrayer was at hand. Judas armed with only a kiss. When they went to seize our Lord, I drew my sword to defend him. No one else came prepared to fight, but Jesus refused my protection, meager as it was. I would have died fighting at his side, but he would not have it. I don't know where the other disciples went but I never lost sight of Jesus. I was there with him walking in the shadows. 
I can hardly say what I was expecting. Moses or Elijah, a voice from heaven, a storm from him whom the winds obeyed, bonds broken to pieces like bread on a hillside, something, anything to end that unthinkable captivity. Instead, there was only a quiet night. The clink of chains, the darkness broken by fires. I could see him with the other soldiers. I went as close as I could, cautious, as I knew that I was out of place. And sure enough, that girl picked me out of the crowd. She would have had me thrown out of the courtyard, but I was determined to stay close to Jesus. I said anything to keep my vow to not leave his side. If I admitted I knew him, they would send me away. Three times I was challenged. And at the third time, I turned and looked at Jesus, saying with my eyes, I am still here. I won't leave you. I will not desert you. But he lifts his eyes and his gaze locks on mine, even as the crazy cry of the rooster announces the dawn. The sound recalls his words that I would deny him three times, but I am still there. I will not desert you. His eyes reach inside me like the shock of a desert dawn. I had missed something essential. I had paid too dearly for the sight of him. I stumbled from that place, stung from the terrible choice of being with or being true. I'd left his side, wildly weeping for a lost savior. I could not save him with my presence, even with a truer word spoken. On Friday night, we left the tomb in silence, our feet heavy on that grave road, clinging to each other for support, every face wet with tears, our steps beating out the refrain of our hearts, he is dead, he is dead. No sleep for me all that long night. Every time I closed my eyes, I was again on that road to Jerusalem, palm branches waving, again at a table with Jesus, again in a garden, again in that courtyard again hearing the news that indeed our Savior Christ the Lord had been murdered, crucified like a criminal. We met the women at the tomb and saw his broken body. As night fell, we put our shoulders to that heavy stone. We left him there in that cold, cold cave. Amen. Oh Lord, I cannot comprehend the depth and breadth of your love. There are not enough words in all languages together to describe what your love means to me. May my love for you and my love for all of your children in some way reflect your love. Let this dark night become fertile soil for growth in your love 
and for our growth as a community of faith. May you use this night to teach us how to love you and to love others the way you have loved us. Oh Lord, we long for newness, for hope, for renewal, for life where there is now death. Out of this darkness, bring us the light of the new dawn. Oh Lord, have mercy on us. Oh Lord, oh Lord hear our prayers. Hear our prayers. We, we hope for you, you and trust, and trust, in trust in your, in your mercy. mercy. We hope for the dawning of a new day. We hope for God to bring newness out of endings. But today, go home. There is nothing more to see. Jesus is dead. Okay. Okay.